One second, Thomas. Okay, Thomas, uh, you can take the word. Uh, that's fine. Thank you. So you can see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. I can see it. It's in presentation mode. It's perfect. Oh, good, good, good. That, that worked. <laughs> So good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Thomas Jeenen. I work at um, ECMWF. I'm actually based in, in Bologna, so I work at uh, Technopolo. Um, and I joined a ECMWF at the beginning of the year to work on a project called Destination Earth. My background is in uh, geophysics, so I, I worked on, uh, on a PhD on, on geophysics on large-scale mental convection. I never finished it, but definitely worked a long time on it. Uh, and then I moved more into the HPC uh, area, on the, in the compute area. I worked at a national HPC lab for uh, quite some time. And then I moved to uh, to engineering company ASML before I joined um, ECMWF to work on to work on Destination Earth. And my particular role is in uh, technology partnership um, management. Basically uh, managing all our external uh, connections and dependencies uh, that we rely on to deliver Destination Earth. So today, what I wanted to do, indeed, as Alberto already mentioned, there's an interesting um, uh, student project for uh, to collaborate on um, on on, uh, on a programming exercise called uh, ECMWF Summer of Weather Code. But before that, I wanted to give a little bit of background on what ECMWF actually is, how we work, a um, little bit on Destination Earth, and then I want to give two examples of of projects that that. Um, we think are interesting are a bit more on the computational side so there's definitely also projects that are more on the, on the data processing side and, and the data visualization data interpretation side but i just wanted to pitch these two so ecmwf is an intergovernmental organization established in 1975 as you can see from this nice historic picture italy is uh, one of the contributing members to uh, to ecmwf and the mission of uh, ecmwf is to advance the weather science to improve global numerical uh, weather prediction. And we are both a research institute to develop uh, the next generation numerical weather codes, but we're also an operational center. So we deliver actual uh, forecast uh, and other data products to our member states. So we use them, for instance, to make like uh, more refined uh, local uh, models and, and forecasts. So how, how do we do that? So ECMWL, ECMWF is very much uh, a data company, so we capture a lot of uh, sensor data from satellites, from ships, from aircraft, from balloons, from, from land uh, observations. We collect all these data and we combine them into numerical simulations of um, Earth system processes. And we have a very, I would say, complicated system where we combine uh, atmospheric models ocean models, ice models, uh, land surface models, uh, together with all this data to make uh, very reliable, very accurate um, uh, numerical weather predictions. Now, since um, a few years, we, we have also um, uh, offices in Bologna. So we moved all the uh, high performance computing and all the data processing services and all the cloud infrastructure uh, to the um, Bologna data center, Technopolo area, where also Cineca will uh, will be in the future. Um, and we also have uh, quite a lot of staff there, uh, mainly focused on, um, on operational part, but also people like me who are more on, um, on, the, on the science part and on the, on the application side. Now, one of the interesting projects that for me, for, us, for me is really relevant because it's, that's what I work on, is, is Destination Earth. So Destination Earth, what, what, what is it? It's um, an attempt to create a digital twin of the Earth. So digital twin is basically a digital uh, replication, a, a highly accurate uh, representation of the Earth itself, including the, the all the physical processes that, that we are interested in. And um, the reason we, we do that is uh, initially for two main areas. The one is climate change and climate adoption. So what a digital twin promises you is that it gives you a much better understanding of the physics and also allows you to run scenarios. So what if scenarios um, based on highly accurate numerical models and, and also real-time data as it, it becomes available. And 
you can also then look into the to the actual impact of um, of your simulations in in a digital sense, and feed that information also back into the system. So it's more it's more like an information system than a simulation uh, environment or or a, or a purely data uh, uh, environment. The reasons to do that are obvious. Uh, climate change poses very big challenges to us, um, financial challenges because it's going to be uh, quite um, expensive to uh, to make uh, adoptions to climate change, but also in in terms of, uh, of, of of human loss. As at the same time, the same applies for uh, for extreme events where we see that uh, the impact of extreme weather events um, is 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 increasing, so the, the impact is increasing. As you can see in, in the top, in the, in the bottom right, you can see that uh, the, the impact of uh, extreme weather events is, uh, is increasing. Another um, promise that digital twins uh, give is that it will give you a tool that allows you to uh, support all the also the decision making uh, making process. So if you have to make a certain decision uh, for climate adoption or a mitigation actions for extreme weather events, it will give you the tools at a very high level to understand what the impact of certain decisions are. So this is in a bit more detailed view. So on the on the right hand side, you have the you have the, the real world, uh, what's actually happening in terms of uh, not only uh, uh, how the how the system how the planet behaves and responds. But also how uh, human responses uh, are, are are monitored. So the socio-economic impact of uh, of climate and of extreme weather is, is monitored there. And on the left-hand side, you have uh, all the technologies, but also the understanding of the physics system on uh, from uh, from a simulation uh, perspective. And by combining these two, these these two, you will have a very powerful uh, environment that allows you to. Uh, to uh, to understand the system much much better than with either uh, either of, uh, of of the of the two. So that, that's what destination Earth is. And now back to the actual topic of uh, of this meeting is the uh, ECMWF Summer of Weather Call. So this has been running for quite a number of years now, uh, and it's it's a very successful program where we invite students uh, from all the all the member states. To participate in, in with ECMWF in uh, advancing uh, uh, our, our our methods and tools, um, and we do that uh, together. So that means that there will be uh, um, uh, mentors from ECMWF uh, supporting students in their in their efforts to uh, in their programming efforts. Um, we also invite students to to come over to come on site to work uh, together. Uh, on these challenges, and of course, there's also some uh, some financial support to make sure that you can you can have access to the computational resources that you need, but also for uh, for other uh, other things that you will be uh, that you will be, be needing. So, how does it work in practice? So, there's an application period. So, actually, the challenges have already been posted. They have been posted on on GitHub. Uh, so, between uh, March 1st and April 15th, you can respond and interact. Uh, with the people who post these uh, these uh, these challenges, then from April 29th we will announce the the project that will actually uh, be running, so the, the winners, and then over the summer there will be a two month a four month uh, long coding phase where actually the something will be implemented, and then afterwards there's a reward reward ceremony, and uh, we've actually seen also that that uh, several of the, the things that have been developed. Are now uh, used in uh, in production at ECMWF. So for us, it's it's really a valuable uh, approach for uh, to drive in innovation within uh, ECMWF. So two particular challenges are they're a bit more computational, but I just want to pitch them anyways. Is that of course running these digital twins um, poses a lot of challenges, and and some of them are on uh, the computational side. So we we're going to run on the next generation uh, supercomputers. And these supercomputers are are very com complex machines, uh, where data has to be moved around a lot between the different uh, components. So you have to imagine that these systems consist of many small compute parts. Um, in in our case, for instance, we already have a, have a system with uh, with a, a million computing cores. Um, but the next generation systems will be even bigger. 
and, and moving data around uh, between these computational units and between the memory and, and, the, and, the, and the compute units, that becomes one of the most expensive in terms of energy, but also the, uh, the most expensive in terms of time of operation that, that you have to do. And, and what we what we propose in one of the challenges, for instance, as, as an example, uh, is to um, to do real time compression of that data while it is moving. So you 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 still uh, keep the full information content of your data, but you reduce the the actual volume of the data by uh, by compressing it. Um, and that is an approach that has been proven very successful in other areas, but the ECMWF we don't use that one yet. So we, we're we're really interested to understand how that uh, how that could help us. Another one which is also uh, very relevant for us is the the energy consumption, energy profiling. Um, so, for instance, most systems at the moment are mainly limited by the amount of power they can they can draw. Uh, so, systems are really designed uh, designed for a low energy consumption. Uh, but it's not only the systems itself; it's also the applications that run on it, uh, where you have some level of control. Um, of how much energy is consumed and understanding uh, in more detail uh, how your application actually consumes power. Uh, that's that's quite interesting. So here, for instance, you see a graph at the, at the top part. You see a very coarse sampled um, energy profile where you can see, OK, yeah, you start up your application and then during the application it consumes energy, obviously. But then if you go into more detail, you can see that different part of your application. So depending on what it's actually doing, uh, the energy consumption is quite dramatically different. Um, and finding strategies on how to modify the way how you compute your solution um, by using different methods that consume less energy, that is a very uh, interesting uh, research activity as well. And for, for this particular case, we're also going to uh, collaborate um, very um, uh, in, intensively uh, with, with vendors like ATOS and NVIDIA and Intel and so on to uh, get a better understanding of how this, how this can be done. So these are just two examples. There, there's many more. I think there's in total something like 15, 16 challenges posted on GitHub. So let me quickly go back to, uh, go back to that slide. So here you, you can see that uh, all these challenges are on GitHub. You can read them. Uh, you can interact uh, with the people who, who, who posted those, those challenges, uh, ask questions and so on. Um, and then uh, you can write a proposal on how you think you will be solving it. And then the best uh, proposals for that solution will be selected for the implementation phase. And that will be that will run then over the summer. And there we will uh, provide a lot of support, both financial, but also in um, in know-how and uh, and manpower to uh, to work together on this on these challenges. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. It is um, it is uh, really uh, really very clear. And uh, I just have uh, first of all, students, if you have any question, I will give the word to you in a, in a few minutes. Uh, I have some preliminary questions that uh, I would like to ask you. First of all, this is more of a comment. Uh, Thomas presented uh, two challenges uh, which are related to basically um, computing optimization or uh, optimization of energy for PC. This is not really related to your expertise because these students, Thomas, are students in environmental and civil engineering, basically. And they are not attending degree programs on informatics or electronic engineering. Mm -hmm. But I want to point out that the other challenges that Thomas mentions are more related to your specific background. So I think it is definitely, or maybe it's potentially interesting also for you. Of course, uh, the the question is whether uh, whether this is really accessible given your background and your uh, commitment, uh, because uh, during summer, of course, you also have to prepare exams. And uh, for this reason, uh, Thomas, I wanted to ask you some more uh, additional information. So uh, first of all, uh, usually the type of students that apply to these uh, challenges are, um, un are graduate students rather than PhD. Can you give us some information on uh, what is uh, the ideal target in your interpretation? I think we, we see ap applications from, from both graduates and also PhD uh, students. In the end, it really um, comes down to the quality of the, of the proposal. Um, 
I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. It's not, it's not the selection criteria. Um, it's really the, the quality of the proposal um, that we're gonna that we're gonna take into consideration and then uh, doing the selection. Okay, that's great. And um, the programming language, what about it? I think uh, maybe Python is what you prefer, or are students allowed also to use other uh, other platforms? In principle, yeah, it also really depends on the kind of challenge. So there's definitely a lot of challenges also around machine learning. But typically, there the domain language is, is will be Python. I would be surprised if people use anything else. But there's not there's no limitation there. Um, the more like uh, computational oriented um, challenges, you might even look into like a C or C++ kind of programming. Uh, but for the more data data science related uh, topics and also the visualization. Um, they would indeed expect Python to be the to be the dominant language. Okay, because uh, just to make uh, the, um, this uh, clear to students, uh, you think that Python is more efficient in terms of visualization and the computational efficiency with respect to other languages. Sorry, uh, uh, did you understand my question? So uh, the um, the question is. Uh, Python is more computationally efficient, uh, and also for visualization, it gives more opportunities. Yeah, it definitely helps a lot in uh, in time to result. So I'm not arguing that Python is maybe the most efficient language in, term, in terms of uh, compute efficiency, but there's just a lot of stuff available in Python that you can that you can uh, reuse. Right, so ah, you okay. Okay, that's clear. Um, do you have any questions, students? And also those who are connected remotely. And it's better if you speak up uh, rather than, but I see I'm also looking at the chat, but it's better if you speak up so we are more interactive. Questions? Yes, yes one question and I can repeat if you don't listen. Let, let's uh, please. Can you give us examples of the challenges you uh, put out and you propose? Okay, so uh, they ask it for an example, some more examples of challenges. Maybe I would say more related to data analysis than uh, with right. respect to, okay, and it's possible. For instance, there, there was an interesting chat already ongoing on um, uh, hydrological, um, one hydrological challenge for the interpretation of um, uh, uh, for, forecast for, um, for, for rivers. And um, how do you call uh, the runoff? So, for instance, there was one. Uh, it was about the visualization and the interpretation of that data. Okay, this is an example. I may add because I, I quickly browsed also the website. I think uh, other challenges are related, for instance, to downscaling the results from climate models. So how to use the results from climate models uh, in uh, uh, for technical purposes. So basically uh, you need downscaling and you may need some kind of corrections uh, in order to adjust uh, for the statistical behaviors that you are expecting at the local scale. So this is another challenge. Like you get the prediction from a climate model, which is uh, uh, already available. You can get these predictions from their website, from uh, the data store and uh, the Copernicus data store, and then uh, you need to correct them uh, in order to adjust for local biases. So this is another example. And uh, also, do you have challenges uh, related to optimal visualization techniques uh, for using the data? I think there are, yeah. the, at least in, in previous years, there definitely have been. I would have to check for this year um, what, the, what the exact uh, challenges in that area, but there's, there's always challenges around that one, like data visualization, data processing, and so on. Okay, that's that's okay. And uh, can you give us an idea of uh, the competitiveness? I guess it is highly competitive. Do you get many applications for for uh, these challenges? Yes, and we also uh, we're only gonna run. So there's also more challenges than with the ones that we're actually gonna run, right? So um, we only gonna going to do it because for us it's also going to be um, quite a uh, time investment uh, mm -hmm. if the proposal really has a high quality. It's not only competition like, okay, there, there's going to be 10 candidates and only one will win, but if you don't see that there's a good 
uh, candidate will just not run it at all. Mm, okay. Okay. I I think uh, you know students. Mm -hmm. Could, yeah. Do you have a question, please? Yes. Is there any uh, deadline for proposals? Yes. So the on this slide that you that you see here now is that um, you have until the April 15 to uh, to apply. This could and be on the, on the yeah. 29th. We will announce which one will actually gonna run and with who. And then from the 2nd of May till the 31st of August, the actual implementation phase will be uh, will be run. Okay. Other questions remotely? Okay, this students could be also an opportunity to be combined with uh, other your commitments like preparation of the master degree thesis. Of course, uh, it could be you could try to combine the two things. This is what I suggest to you because this is a kind of application which is a tremendously useful exercise. Uh, even if uh, the application is rejected, uh, uh, I think it, it is a very interesting exercise because in the future you will have to prepare applications. And therefore, to start with this opportunity could be really interesting. And if you combine with uh, some of your other commitments, like thesis, then I mean, you anyway save your work because you prepare a proposal. If the proposal doesn't run, anyway, you can try to run it for preparing your thesis. And uh, so I think it is really interesting. The only thing you understand that uh, you have to be you have to be very prepared and skilled in computer programming. And uh, not really, don't think that you need exceptional qualities, but you need to be dedicated on that because, uh, uh, of course, uh, it, it will be the subject of your application and your thesis, maybe, to prepare a computer program, which I think uh, it would be, again, extremely interesting for you because you would gain skills that otherwise you wouldn't be motivated to gain, and I think they are extremely useful. For instance, learning Python, if you don't know it, I think it is extremely useful because, as I mentioned to you, the more you know about alternative uh, solutions for solving a problem in terms also of computer programming and the more skilled uh, you are for your future career. Thomas, I think that uh, this is great. I would like to thank you very much and then uh, we will get in touch again. We have another meeting in the afternoon, so we can yes. come. But Perfect. I would like to thank you because I think this has been excellent. Thank you, and thanks for providing the opportunity to speak to the, to the students. Okay, and on behalf of the students, thank you once again. All right, thank you. Have a nice Bye. day. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, students, now Thomas is leaving, so I need to... My screen is not shared now. You have to give me one second because I need to set it back to the original configuration and then I think I need also to try to solve the problem in the of the screen in the room which is not visible. Okay. So students connected remotely, give me one second. And uh, so first, let me make some additional comments on this presentation. And uh, so first of all, what about this opportunity? Some more comments. There are some few things that he didn't say. And one thing is uh, the compensation, the reimbursement for the winners is 5,000, just to give you an idea. So it, it's, it's not low, but it's not, um, I mean, uh, <laughs> an immense amount of money, but still it's it's uh, it's something. It's typically the value of a scholarship. And uh, is this opportunity interesting for you? Uh, yes, but I would say, as I already stated, that it would be ideal if, we, if you could combine it with uh, something else, like internship uh, or uh, thesis. So if you have internship in your, uh, in your um, in your study plan, I am sure that this activity can be accepted as an internship activity at ECMWF because also you have to spend some time there in Bologna. Thomas is in Bologna. Maybe that uh, they said that uh, they may also offer some time in the UK because they have three 
three headquarters, one in the UK, in Reading, one in Berlin, and one in Bologna. So maybe that you have to spend some time there. And uh, so uh, what, what I say is uh, internship, I think it, it would be perfectly fine. I would say more than the internship. So you should uh, try, if you want to get this opportunity, you should try to, to combine internship plus thesis. And if the proposal doesn't win, okay, we can anyway take uh, valid the internship uh, in uh, your, for instance, you may need some preparation, some study of Python if you don't know it, or whatever language, he said Python, because Python, it's, um, it's very well uh, harnessed for visualization, for uh, it's, it's a step more with respect to R. And it's a bit, uh, I would say that as a level of difficulty, it's comparable, but it's a step more. R has a, an interface in R Studio, which is a little bit more efficient in, in, uh, in terms of user friendliness. So what is the requirement? Of course, the requirement is that you have to be motivated in, in learning uh, computer programming. Again, it would be extremely useful, but on the other end, uh, I understand that probably most of you at, the, at present, they don't have the background that is needed. So the background will, will, would need to be acquired. And uh, the deadline is quite close. I learned about this opportunity just a couple of weeks ago. I thought that it is a good idea to propose it to you, but uh, still it's, it's, uh, it's quite close. I understand that. So uh, I'm not sure uh, that now in one month you may have uh, the time, but what I suggest to you, have a look at the website, have a look at the challenges. Don't be discouraged. The first time that you have a look, I tried to have a look uh, a couple of days ago and uh, I thought, okay, if I had to get involved in this, it would be a lot of work by 15 of April. But, you know, when you look for a new opportunity, the first glance, the first feeling is always something that is not for me. And this regularly happens to me. So when I am excited about a challenge, I look at it and the first feeling is, it's too much. I, I'm, not, I'm not good enough for this. I am preparing now a proposal, which, uh, I thought it was uh, it was too much for me up to Christmas maybe, and then I decided that after after some thinking, after some studying, I realized that I may try. So I decided to prepare this proposal. Still, probably the proposal will be rejected, but that's life. In in your, in your career, you will have uh, challenges. Some of them will go, others will not go. So for me to, to become a professor was a challenge. At the beginning, I thought that it's impossible for me, but then. Finally, at least becoming a professor, I succeeded. There are many other challenges that I undertook where I didn't succeed. This is quite normal. And uh, so don't be concerned if at the first glance you, you think that it's too much for you. Just look at it, try to give some time to it because you can't get a, a, a good feeling in 10 minutes. You need to read and then set back. Don't spend much time continuously. When we do something that is demanding, we need to, to do it step by step. So read something and then put it aside, wait a couple of days, read again. And this is the way in which you can, in a way, really getting into something. And then you decide. If you decide to go, let me know. I'm not promising that I can assist you heavily, but we could plan uh, not not in the midterm. I, I don't have time uh, April 15 to attend continuously a student submitting an application. This is not possible for me. But if you submit the application and it succeeds, uh, I can take the commitment of uh, attending you later on during the summer. This is uh, something that is possible. Okay. I hope you didn't mind this presentation, which I think it's uh, anyway giving a perspective of what ECMWF does. Just to close, I would like to say ECMWF has this project which is financed by the European Union, creating the digital twin. And they are already making a lot of activities. Their basic problem is that uh, member states should uh, use them, and not all of them use the ECMWF products. 
In the meteorological forecasting, they are fairly used across Europe. But for other products that they make available, for instance, river flow forecasting, they are not really used. Why? Because there are, uh, in member states, local systems that are already working, which are specifically tailored for the local situation. ECNWF is modeling, uh, is adopting a pan-European approach, is modeling at the European le level. And what comes out is that uh, when you go to the specific site, uh, the predictions are not as good as those that uh, are run by the local institutions. So it happens frequently, for instance, for the Pori, where in Italy they say, no, our model is more precise. And therefore, they have this uh, need for getting at the local level. This is why I said they have some challenges that are related to downscaling, fitting the local needs. And this is where you could eventually find something uh, where you can contribute. OK, there is something in the chat. Let me have a look. And then I think, uh, OK, I didn't find the mouse. Let me have a look at the chat. Ah, OK, it's just the link by Thomas. It's in the chat, so it will stay there. And Let me go on my website. Good. And let's go in our page, uh, Sustainable Design. So um, I wanted to start this exercise here, estimation of the flow duration curve. And let's click on it. Uh, and if you click on it, uh, you get uh, two, um, two files. Uh, I think uh, we already started. Uh, we already did last time the upload uh, of the series. OK, very good. Now, let's uh, look at the exercise. I think uh, we already read it, but let me read it again. What is asked here is to estimate the flow duration curve for the Po River at Ponte Lago Scuro. So the first thing that we have to do is uh, to, to upload the data, and I assume that you already uploaded it, but uh, in, we will look at the R code that I am proposing, and uh, through the R code uh, I, will, uh, I will upload the data again. Now, uh, we have to estimate the flow duration curve by using two methods. The two methods that we learned. So there is uh, a first method, which is uh, the um, a first method, which is uh, by pulling all the data together. And the second method is uh, by estimating for each year of the observation period, the flow duration curve. One thing, one second. OK, so computation of the flow duration curve with the two methods. OK, let's start with the first one. We pull all the data together. You remember that we look at the theory. We have to rearrange the data in descending order from the highest to the lowest. And from that, we estimate the flow duration curve. We have to do it in two R. So let's look, uh, first of all, at the suggested R code on my website. There is already a suggested R code here, and uh, let's open it. And uh, first, uh, note that the fact that you have already a suggested R code, which is very short, as you see, it's an aid. It's an aid that allows us to speed things up. And we particularly need this aid today because we lost about one hour of lecture. So uh, let's uh, uh, now look then at the code. But what I recommend to you is that you make an effort as an homework uh, to re, uh, re read the code again and understand what each uh, line, each instruction does, OK? So let's look at this code, which is very short. And the way I want to move forward is step by step to copy each instruction in the R console 
I have a question for you. Sorry, because I have so many courses. Did I already introduce uh, RStudio to you or? OK, very good. So we can copy into RStudio. But into RStudio, I want to copy into the console for now, not in the script. OK, just let's uh, because given that I want to, I have just a few minutes to go. And given that I want to do it line by line in order to give you the chance to understand better. Let's work on the console. The first instruction is a comment, uh, OK? And it says, be careful of the path in the line below. Actually, I think you already have the data of the poor evil. But if you don't have the data, these are, this is the instruction to upload it, uh, OK? And if you don't understand uh, what it means because you didn't attend the last exercise, uh, I think uh, you need to skip this now. OK, let's assume that you already have the data uploaded or if not, you already know how to upload them in our studio. Anyway, you can upload the data. OK, let me go then into our studio. I copy this instruction. And let me go into our studio. Here is our studio, and uh, let me just see one thing. If I already have the data from last time, no. So let me just uh, give me one second because I need to put the data file from my website in the right place. Uh, okay, just one second. Tutorials of sustainable design, Let's, let me see. And I take the data file from here. OK, extract to desktop. Good. Now I can go to our studio and upload the data. Just one second, because I need to give the fact. OK, I uploaded my data. Now, just to make sure that everything is fine, let's plot this data. Plot Po, Ponte Lago Scuro, sorry, river flow. Plot river flow, type equal line. OK, here is my data plot that you see. No, you don't see it on the screen, but uh, anyway, if you have uh, the screen shared, you can see it. OK, very good. Now I go back to the code and let's look at the other lines. So the code says, uh, first of all, it creates a vector named duration. Duration is uh, the vector which is setting the order of the data from 1 to 32,850. The number 32,850 is precisely the length of the river flow vector. OK, so let me just copy this. I go back to our studio and I create this vector. It's a sequence. What did we create? If you plot duration, so I get the previous plot instruction, and now I plot the duration. You see that it's just a rectilinear segment, OK? Because it's a sequence from 1 to 32,850. If you check, this is precisely the length of river flow. You see? And if you take the length of river flow and divide by 90, given that I removed the 29th of February, what you expect here is a result by dividing the length of the vector of data by the number of the years, 90, 
you should get 365, which is okay. These checks are just to make sure that you upload the correct vector. Very good. Now, duration is extended from one to 32,850, but I said that it's better to express the duration in percentage terms or in terms of uh, the range one 365. This is much better because it's more meaningful for me, okay? Because the duration either in percentage term or in, in into the range one 365 is more meaningful. So let's transform this vector. You may choose to transform it in percentage terms or in the range one 365. I choose the second, so let me clear the console. I say duration is equal to duration, sorry, duration divided by 90. And then if I take the max of duration, max duration, it should be 365, which is okay. The mean of duration actually is less than one is less than one. Why? Because the minimum duration that I have is not one day, is less than one day, because I have 90 years of data. Okay? So, as I said, the advantage of this first method that pulls all the data together is the resolution. I don't have a value of the flow duration curve for each day. I have 90 of them for each day. Because in 90 years, how many 1st of January do I have? 90. And therefore, for each day, I have 90 observations. And this is why the minimum is not one, but it is precisely one divided by 90. OK, now what do we have to do in order to plot the flow duration curve? We have to rearrange the data in descending order from the highest to the lowest. Let's look at the code. The code says, the code is rearranging the vector with this instruction, which I am copying. I copy it, I go to R, I clear the console, and then you see that it is creating a new vector, river flow one, which is given by sorting river flow decreasing equal true. Now, river flow one is my flow duration curve. If I plot river flow one, uh, this is the y axis. The x axis is duration, river flow one. And I put type equal, sorry, type equal line. This is my flow duration curve for the poor river. You see, it is extremely simple. What is less simple is uh, the second method. It's a bit less simple. Let me look at the code, what the code suggests uh, for moving forward. Uh, first of all, there is a plot here which is more sophisticated, and let's uh, look at it. Let's make another plot which is more sophisticated. You see that now it's a little bit better. It's looking nicer. There is a title. So look at this instruction, how I did to put a title. I put label in the axis. There is still one thing that it doesn't work really well, which is the exponent uh, cubic meters per second. It's not an exponent, um, but let's forget about it for now. If you want to add a grid, you can just type grid in the R console and you get a nicer graph. OK, good. Now let's look at the next uh, lines of the code. The code now needs to compute a flow duration curve for each year. So it needs to compute 90 flow duration curve. So how this is done? First of all, the solution that I suggest is to create another data object, the river flow two, which is an array. It's an array where 
each uh, column, you see that the number of columns is 90, each column contains the data for each year. The array is created here, and then it starts a four cycle, something that we didn't see yet. It's very simple. It's a cycle that uh, orders each column of the array in uh, descending order. And therefore, in the resulting array, I get the 90 flow duration curves. And then I can plot them. So let's try to copy these instructions in order to see what happens. Creation of the array. Four cycle to order the columns in descending order. And here there is a mat plot, which is an instruction to plot a matrix. OK. Let's look at here. What happens? And you see on the screen that you have the 90 flow duration curves, which is precisely what I wanted to do. Very good. Now, the code is, I think our task is finished. The code here is moving forward by computing the average, because in the graph there is not yet the average, and computing a range for each duration, it gives a range of river flow, which is given by average plus minus standard deviation. OK, so if I take these lines and I copy them. Here. What you see now is in the graph that there is the average in red and the range of variability in blue, it is average plus minus standard deviation. That's it. I apologize because uh, of what happened, but at the end of the story, we were able to look all together at the exercise. In order to, to add some more time, on Monday, Monday we don't have lectures, on next Thursday, I will ask you if you have any question on that. And uh, if you ask for it, we can also take half an hour and repeat it more slowly. OK, very good. Do you have any questions so far? Thank you for your understanding today. I am also thanking the students that were connected remotely. For the videos of today, I will have some hard time to get it uploaded because uh, I need to cut the pieces where uh, we were just uh, looking at the setting. So just be patient. I will make an effort by the weekend to upload everything. <laughs>